You can sit here, Kristen. Call this general meeting to order. Stand up to the plan. Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and it is all for the Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight. Little last minute cancel, I'm sure, on all of your evening. Um, so if any member of the public would like to comment on an agenda item, please fill out one of the blue comment cards located in the lobby. I'll give it to the board secretary in the corner of the room. If you're attending virtually through Zoom, place comments in the chat and the board secretary, Tanya Jones, will call on you at the appropriate time. Comments are limited to three minutes per individual. Current policy allows for any item on the agenda to be open for comment. Please remember to state your name when we're voting so Tanya knows who we are. Um, and agenda item 2.0, Superintendent Sweeney. Are there any written communications? There were none. All right. Um, any questions or comments under 2.0? Hearing none. I will move on. Actually, yes. Moving on to 3.0. Can we vote on that? All items on the consent agenda can be approved by a single motion unless a member of the board or Superintendent Sweeney requests an item to be changed, removed, or voted on separately. Are there any changes, additions to the board agenda and the minutes from last meeting? This is Member Nelson. I motion to accept the consent uh, agenda. Board member Aguilera, second. Right. Having a second, is there any discussion? Hearing none, Tanya, can you do a roll call for Abstain. Consent agenda. Yes. <laughs> member Nelson? Yes. Member Aguilera? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Palmer? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. All right, 4.0 reports. We have a lot of them tonight. It's a participant. So Highland, Principal Van Manning. Hey, so thank you. We wanted to take an opportunity to talk about our Smile Club. About a year ago, Mr. Cook came to me and said he had found this uh, Smile Club at Oregon State University. You know, the board has talked about this, reaching out to other schools, but we wanted to show what that looks like for our kids. And so we have a couple of students to talk and I'm gonna turn it right over to Mr. Cook and Mrs. Jackson, who are two fifth grade teachers who run this program every Tuesday after school. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so like Devin said, we I really wanted an after school club for kids to do, and I was really looking for something with uh, STEAM, STEM technology or activities. Um, I even talked to Nevin at one point about a possible budget for some kind of activity. Then my kids who are at Hidden Valley kept talking about the Smile Club, Smile Club. They loved it. So I looked into it and really liked what I saw on Oregon State's website. So I reached out for information and was just, I was on board as soon as I got the information from Oregon State. Just the, the lessons and curriculum and hands-on activities they were presenting just seemed fantastic. So I went and I talked to my teaching partner uh, next door to see if it would be something she'd be interested in. So he came to me last spring and said, hey, would you be interested in running Smile Club with me? And I kind of looked at him and I'm like, smile? But, you know, something with your teeth, dentistry. I had no idea what smile stood for, but I quickly learned that smile stands for science and math and investigative learning experiences for the kids. So we met with Becca and Jay, who are the smile advisors from uh, Oregon State University. They run all the pre-college programs. And we Zoomed with them for about an hour. We asked Mr. Van Manen to join us. And... I was hooked right away. Um, just the opportunities to give to our students um, was something that you couldn't say no to. Um, and so I was hooked and said, yes, I will do it with you starting um, in the fall. 
Yeah, so uh, before we were really on board with SMILE um, officially as a district, they sent us up to Oregon State for their summer workshop. So three days up at Oregon State with their professional development. We got to experience the lessons hand on as if we were the students. And what's really nice is you do the lessons, you provide feedback, and they adjust the lessons to match whatever level you're at, elementary, middle, or high school. Um, and they even sent me home with boxes of lessons, materials, and everything needed to get the club ready and started. Yeah, and they didn't even actually know that we were officially on board. We were still dealing um, with, you know, the logistics of having the after school club. Um, we still had to talk to Susan Zatola and get everything finalized, but they sent him home with everything. So Tim and I actually just got back from the winter workshop. They do offer a lot of professional developments for teachers, which is great. And we got to be students for two days. We got to go to Oregon State. They paid for subs. They paid for our hotels and our meals. And we really just got to dive in and be kids for two days, which was great. So we did um, all of the new upcoming lessons that we are bringing back to our students to do for the rest of the winter and spring term. Um, and it was it was it was fun. I mean, it was so fun and engaging. Long days. We started at seven thirty in the morning and went till about seven thirty at night, but it didn't feel like that. Um, the great thing that they're doing this year is we actually have an all day challenge coming up on April 22nd, all of the elementary smile members, um, will all be at Southern Oregon university and they get to collaborate together and do challenges together with math and science and art. Um, they get to go on a college tour. They are provided lunch and it's just a great way for them to collaborate with other students that are involved in smile throughout our region. And then they also, we found out when we were up there a couple weeks ago that they're giving us $1,000 for our for all each club. Um, we're, this will be new to you guys. Um, we get to go on a Springfield trip. So Tim and I have been picking around some ideas. We were thinking of maybe taking them to the tide pools and doing some exploring and then coming back through the Redwoods um, or also spending the day at the Oregon Capes. So we've got those coming up. Um, so we had quite a bit of students interested in Smile Club. We held our first parent meeting, um, our the second week of school. We had over 40 applicants. Oregon State recommends about 20. We ended up accepting 21 just because of the mix of students we had. Um, the criteria for selection through Oregon State is student must be working at grade level, have good behavior, be recommended by a teacher. Priorities given to students who were previously Smile members to encourage continuity through the program. Minority students, low-income students, and those who would be the first in their families to go to college. Right now, we have a good 50-50 mix of boys and girls from fourth and fifth grade. We meet one hour a week. Um, also, one of the requirements for having a small club is a family math and science night. We had ours in October. The, the small program from Oregon State was a huge help in getting this all organized for us. They sent down people. They sent down supplies to help us run the station. And we had over 350 people in the gym that night going through the different what, six stations? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so, so far, we started, so we started in September. We've actually already held 18 club meetings with the students. Some of the things that we've done with them, again, it's all been hands-on, um, is we actually attached a trail cam down at Gilbert Creek and took pictures uh, for a couple weeks of what animals and things that we find down there, and then we studied, so it was called Animals in Our Community. Uh, spreading infectious diseases, finding patient zero. We did a lesson on cross-laminated timber. We've done a lot of nature observations with actual scientific sketching, the labeling and making observations. Um, we've done a super taster gene lesson. We've done a singer and sound wave lesson. That was a big hit. We recently, we've been talking about trees and their growth and how old uh, trees are determined by their rings. <laughs> Um, and what it can tell us about their growth rate. And then we also recently did some concept map, uh, excuse me, concept mapping um, with tree growth, identifying the different things a tree needs to grow and how they're actually connected. Um, and then re uh, last week we worked on an engineering and design activity where kids had to design a tower with limited resources and limited time. Um, that was a really fun one. Um, we've really tried hard to spread the word to the other schools. That's been the thing of not just having Highland be the Smile Club. Um, so since we've started, we've definitely been talking a lot about it. Um, 
Alana lot to anybody that will listen. So now not just Highland has a, a club, there are now three elementaries in our district that have a smile club. Both of the middle schools now have a, a smile club and Gladiola just recently reached out to us and they're interested in getting more information and possibly starting a club. Um, we, again, like Tim said, we hold our meetings every Tuesday and we are gonna continue all the way through May. So we can provide this for our students. Um, but to get the best idea of how it works, we brought two of our amazing students with us who I'm not going to introduce. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. They're fifth graders at Highland. So if you would come on up and. Hi, my name is Remy and I'm in Ms. Jackson's class. Hi, my name is Grayson and I'm from Mr. Cook's class. And just to say, we didn't know what they were going to say, so we might repeat some of the stuff. <laughs> um, first thing is, yes, small stands for science, math, investigative learning experience experiences. And what it is, it's just a fun club where you get to learn about science, math, art, and there's some writing in there too. And it, I think it's just one of the funnest after school clubs I've ever done. Um, and every week on Tuesday at 2.30 p.m., we meet in Mr. Cook's classroom and we discuss what we are going to be doing that day. Um, the thing that I really like about Smile Club is that it's not just a normal club where you learn normal stuff. It's a club where you really get to use your brain and think about real-world problems. What I like most about Smile Club is it's not necessarily just learning. We also get to do fun activities while learning new things and exploring. Um, my favorite project that we've done in the club was the study of epidemiology. Um, that's the study of how diseases spread. And it was just a really fun experiment to do because there was a really cool backstory behind it as well. My favorite activity was the taste testing activity because we got to have these little strips that were different colors and we got to split up into groups and report what we tasted on each of the strips. Um, and I think another thing the whole Smile Club is looking forward to is the SOU trip, like they said. And I'm really, I'm really hoping that it's going to be great fun. And this is what Smile Club is all about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, we have a short video that we put together. Oh. We can pick that up. So we put a video together. My favorite thing about Smile Club is that I get to have fun and learn about science and math 
while I hanging out with my friends and we were doing an experiment just now and we were laughing we're like, oh, we have to try this. Oh, it's so cool. Come on, you do it too. We always shared with each other. We were just always kind and it made me feel really loved and happy so I could hang out with my friends. Uh, I like learning uh, new things every day. It's fun. Um, my favorite thing about Smile Club is that the people there are really fun to work with work with and so it's really fun being in groups and also i learned a lot of things in smile club the thing i like most about smile club is that we're doing something new all the time we're always learning something and it's just great fun um one of the best parts is just to be around friends that you have and just to learn something new and it's one of the best after school clubs i've ever been in that's why i like smile club fun what i like best about smile club is that everybody's super kind um my favorite thing about Smile Club is that honestly, it's really just a very fun learning experience and I find out about the history behind a lot of things like sound waves and for one of our first lessons, we uh, set up a trail cam around and it's just, it's a really fun learning experience for me, a lot. I like seeing my friends and getting to play getting to do all of the fun activities. What I like about Smile Club is the most is it's not necessarily all just learning. Like to learn, we do a bunch of all like fun stuff. Like we went down to the creek to see what animals we saw. And then we did a taste test to, to see if we had a certain gene in our body that could have, a, it's called super tasters, to see if we could taste different type of things. And that's really what I like most about Smile. That it's not necessarily just learning, that we can also have fun. My favorite part of Smile Club is doing the experiments and stuff. I really like Smile Club because it looks at kids' imaginations and how they like about Smile and what type of science and what type of culture and stuff that they would like. And I don't have any more. My favorite thing about Smile Club is that um, all the activities we do is very fun. And Smile Club is just like a pretty cool after school activity club. Um, we can learn new things. And I learned a whole bunch of new things. I even remember our first experiment. Um, we did an experiment about patient zero. And it was really, really fun. We got to see who was patient zero, which was Mr. Cook. And we, got, we found out who got infected and who wasn't. I didn't get infected, but still, it was really cool. And I remember our after school party before winter break. And we had a whole bunch of pizza. We got to know each other more. We even did a fun little experiment on taste. And that's all. I like how we learn while also having fun in all the uh, science activities we do. The reason I like Smile Club is because there's lots of activities like um, science and art, and that's why I like Smile Club. Uh, it's really, uh, I like Smile Club because it's really educational and uh, it has uh, really fun activities that can be like even done sometimes at home. Like if, like if, uh, like if you have the right stuff for it and it's uh, just really cool experiments and it, it helps with, uh, it helps with like learning different things that, and it, uh, uh, it's just really fun. My favorite thing about Smile Club is probably the fact that like, we're not only doing one thing constantly, we're doing each week we come back and we're doing another thing and it's super involved with like science and nature and math. So you really get to really like challenge yourself with it. I like Smile Club because I get to hang out with my friends and get, like find new activities to do and learn about all kinds of science stuff. The reason I like Smile Club is because I can do a bunch of activities with my friends. The reason I like Smile Club is A, it's fun. 
B, there, there's, you learn a lot of things, and C, there, during the extra recess that we get since we're in Smile Club, the girls just are around picking up things, which is kind of funny to watch them do. The reason I like Smile Club is because we get to learn new stuff every day, and we get to do so many hands-on activities. It's just really fun. That's my public Highland, and uh, I want to thank Cook and Ms. Jacks for all their work, and uh, Remy, the certificate signed by our board chair for your work tonight, and Grayson, thank you. you have any questions for us? Else we'll move along. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So item number 4.2 is Project Youth Plus. Taking the rose. Taking <laughs> absolutely. Make sure it gets an app. <laughs> oh, I'm like, uh... hey everybody. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Yes. Yeah. yes. Wonderful uh, honor to be with you all here today and to introduce uh, the new executive director of Project Youth Plus, uh, Carl Thomas. I've been around forever. <laughs> uh, my wife and I own a small business in Medford, the salon. Um, it's not huge at all. We have uh, 14 stylists, uh, two estheticians, and uh, a guy who does teeth whitening. Uh, and I've worked for the university system. Well, it was a system um, for 27 years, seven years in Southern Oregon, where I graduated, seven years at Oregon State. So I'm familiar with SMILE. Um, a quick year at Eastern Oregon University and 11 and a half years at Oregon Tech. But I've served on the board for Project Youth Plus since 2018. And they've been recruiting me into this position because they keep doing great work and getting me to tear up and <laughs> just pull at my heartstrings when they reach out to families and I drive out to Rogue River to meet with Brenda and we're going to take cash and gift cards to families and because at that time maybe they weren't really particularly in, uh, concerned about their College Plus account at that point they were concerned about hygiene items and where they're going to stay and and this organization just won me over I thought I was going to leave the search for the new executive director, and then I decided shortly into that that I'm going to apply for the position, and they were gracious enough to offer me the position, and I, I accepted. So I'm a, a month in, a month and three days. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I just want to say <clears throat> that this is my last uh, week uh, working with Project Youth Plus, um, and it's it's been incredible uh, privilege for me to, to work at this organization uh, as director for the last five years and for about a year and a half before that um, as I was getting onboarded. And um, I'm a son of Southern Oregon, and this has been just an, an incredible opportunity for me. Now, it's been, it's been a minute since we presented here um, uh, in front of the board, and so Trish encouraged us to Kind of start with a top level view of the organization as a, a bit of a refresher for anybody who's not um, as familiar. Uh, so Project Youth Plus, uh, yeah, our, our mission is to increase opportunities uh, for youth to thrive in schools, careers, and life. Um, and uh, this is our picture of our senior send off 
from 2021. This is an event we do uh, every at the, at the beginning of every summer uh, with all the graduating seniors from all the schools that we serve. Um, and it's uh, usually held up here in uh, Grants Pass, uh, something we love doing. Um, and I, I think we're going to get to the history here, but yes, here it is. Uh, this organization began in 1998, um, and, and it began in Grants Pass School District with 33 sixth graders, um, I, I believe, at North Middle. And uh, and we have been growing and evolving ever since. Uh, currently, we're serving 1,500 students a year across our different programs. And I'm going to go into... A little bit of uh, that. Uh, who do we serve? Uh, starting it with sixth graders, so it's middle school and high school. Um, and also, as of two years ago, uh, we now serve out of school youth from age 16 up to age 24. Uh, and that is with our I throw a partnership with the Rogue Workforce Partnership. And so those are career development uh, services that we're providing uh, to those out of school youth. Um, so who do we serve? It's it's students who have serious life challenges, things like uh, homelessness, being in the foster system, um, students who are underrepresented, uh, and and students with different barriers to employment um, at, listed there. <clears throat> what do we do? We like to think of it as leveling the playing field. Um, that uh, we offer mentoring for, for the youth who are enrolled in our programs, we have for mentoring from a competent caring adult. Right now we have six full-time staff um, that are dedicated to serving students at Grants Pass schools. Um, we like to be a, a one-stop shop for community service opportunities uh, for the students, for the youth that we serve, helping them get that experience on the real world and starting to kind of build up their their resumes um, for when it comes time for whatever is after college, after high school, whether that be college or something else, uh, support on applications, financial aid, tours to the schools, uh, to, to the universities uh, for students who are interested, and also scholarships. I, I am sure that most of the people in this room have been to at least one scholarship night, um, Grants Pass uh, uh, School District Scholarship Night, and, and the, the scholarships that, that we hand out uh, on that night, <clears throat> there, there's two things. There's senior awards for all the seniors who have uh, graduated uh, and were participating in our programs, and a lot of students are recognized for scholarships that they might have received as early as sixth grade, something that we call the competitive scholarship, where we encourage students to answer all the same questions that they have to answer on an OSAC application or for the, the Redwood uh, Foundation. Same questions, they have to give teacher recommendations, they have to get over that fear of asking for that, uh, and, they, and they start getting comfortable with an activities chart and understanding that it's good to be involved in things. Um, so that's the, uh, the those are the, the scholarships that we're handing out every year. Um, and then also summer enrichment experiences. This is something that has grown dramatically in the last few years. Um, we, we just recently hired someone whose job full-time year-round is helping us prepare and be ready for summer to, to have it as, as jam-packed opportunities and activities as possible. Um, also, something we call barrier removal funds, um, not burial removal <laughs> funds that it often gets heard that way, but uh, <clears throat> these are funds that are available uh, for the students in our programs to help them with anything that might present itself as a barrier and anything that could be fixed with uh, some money for an activity fee or perhaps a, a new pair of shoes or whatever it is. It is, it, our, our staff are creative. They are good at getting to know the, the students that they're working with and finding out what are the ways that we can help you. Um, and then finally, individual development accounts. These are matched savings accounts. Project Youth Plus is, an, is a participant in something called the Oregon IDA Initiative, Individual Development Account Initiative, which is an amazing, thing that, that I think a lot of people in this state that don't realize that Oregon is really a, a national leader when it comes to these kinds of asset building programs. So students who enroll in this program, if they're eligible, they can save up to $2,000 
That's and that's money that they have saved. It gets matched five to one. So if you save two thousand dollars, you get that gets matched to ten thousand dollars to help with what comes after high school. That's great. <laughs> and uh, and and that is flexible. That is, you know, we used to be called college dreams, and it would we used to be really, uh, you know, all about college access. Well, it's that is not what we are anymore, which is why we changed our name a couple of years ago to Project Youth Plus. <laughs> Uh, so the students that get those, so we still have the College Plus program. Yes, very important. So yes, still do that. <laughs> and 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 three of the our staff that are working at your schools, that's what well, that's what they're doing is, is College Plus. Um, but those match savings accounts can be used for any post secondary training or education. Um, so if that's trade school, if that's tools uh, to allow you to go to trade school, whatever we are here to help with that. Another one of the pieces of Project Youth Plus that won me over. <laughs> Working in college admissions, of course, I was recruiting students and working with them from elementary to middle school, high school. It was all about college attainment. But across Oregon and all the other places I went to visit, invariably I got in conversations with students who weren't necessarily geared towards college, at least right after high school. So it was nice to see this program evolve into that place where students can go and say, hey, I'm, I'm really not interested in college. And they get support to identify a career and work towards a career. Um, you know, we they, we spread the net wider to really help more more of the students and the kids in the community. So these are our core programs: College Plus. Uh, that is the that's our legacy yeah. program. It's 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 college prep really, and and everything that goes into that. Whatever it takes is our. Uh, Dropout Prevention and Reengagement Program. Um, this is a more recent program, and we've been doing it here. At, this is, I believe, year four. I'm going to sneeze. I'm going to be sorry. I'm going that out. Uh, year, I believe it's it's year four here. In is it six? We're on year six in Grants Pass uh, uh, schools, and um, and that that's a program that is uh, it, it's supported uh, with state funding. Um, but also supported with our by, through our contract uh, with the uh, school district. And then Career Build, this is the program that really expanded uh, to start serving these out of school youth. But, but we have also been doing for five years prior to that expansion, we were still doing this program mainly with students. And so the, and the main activity there is, is providing paid internships for students who, who are interested. They want to get a taste of what it, you know, would be like to work in a dental hygienist or, you know, a dental clinic, something like that. We are able to bring those youth onto our payroll and then um, pay them to go work for a local employer. And then the local employers get youth who are there to, to help them um, and, and do work, but also uh, who are interested in the field and, and it's a mentoring opportunity. Um, so that's career bill. And Keep going because I don't want this to take too long. So and then auxiliary, auxiliary programming, that paid work experience, that's kind of the, the key part of the career build program. And then the plus accounts are those matched savings accounts uh, okay. that I mentioned earlier. A lot of people ask where our funding comes from. This is where our funding comes from. Um, and so you see a big, uh, the biggest chunk is is the RWP Youth Career Build. That's that's career bill. That's the uh, you know professional uh, training uh, program, uh, workforce development program uh, that we have. And after that, you see foundation grants are a very big part of it. Uh, we get a federal grant and some state grants. School district contracts make up ten percent of our total funding picture, uh, but it, it's a crucial ten percent. I, I and I. I I just can't uh, say it enough. We are so, so grateful. We know that school boards, all the, all the districts that we partner with, it's not easy to make decisions about where to allocate your resources year to year. Um, but, but it really, uh, the, the, this contract helps us maximize the, that whole picture um, and, and bring in all these different kinds of funding. And, and, and we believe helps the districts that we partner with really stretch their dollars further. Uh, for more impact. And then really quick, our outcomes in 2022. So for the College Plus program, I, uh, on the top is talking about all the, the scholarships. 
um, that were uh, done by uh, students uh, across the different grade levels. Um, and then our outcomes uh, are second, and this is uh, just in Josephine County, secondary school persistence. Uh, you can see that for each of these, we, ha we have a target. This is a federal grant and we're, where you're required to set targets. We were, Carl and I were looking at this a couple of days ago and he said, so why don't you, why isn't your target 100% for <laughs> secondary school persistence? <laughs> And the answer is when you do these grants, you, you need to have a target that is both ambitious and uh, attainable. And so all of the targets that you see here are targets that, that you know, for, for the, the work that we're doing and, and who we are doing that work with, these are ambitious targets. Uh, but we pick them because they're attainable. But as you can see, we have really surpassed the targets in each category. Um, and, and we're very proud of that. And, and we know that we did not do that alone. I, one of the reasons why I always refer to Grants Pass District as, as like our flagship um, partnership is because we have more staff here than any other district in the way that they work together in the College and Career Center. Is, is that what it's called? Is that yes. right? Yes. The College and Career Center <laughs> is, um, it, it's that that's it's the model. That's the gold standard that we, we hope to achieve in, anywhere else that we are. But our, our, our staff are really integrated with the district uh, staff there to serve the students of Grants Pass High School as well as Ladiola and the middle schools. <clears throat> Whatever it takes program. So here you can see it broken out by district and on the bottom right, um, in the Grants Pass School District in 2022, we were serving 83 students. And again, this is for dropout prevention and re-engagement. Uh, you can see that the, the results of, of students who were able to complete it, the, their GED or get their uh, diploma. And of the students enrolled into whatever it takes at Grants Pass schools, the graduation rate for them was 99%. That's better than any of the other districts that we were at. Um, and so we're very proud of that. And again, it, it works because of the partnership um, and uh, just just the way that we have developed a wonderful working relationship with this district over the years. Uh -oh. Okay. Um, and then uh, finally, just uh, some numbers uh, for our plus accounts this last year. Uh, total matched is 418,000, but I, to me, it's almost what's more impressive is the total saved that 147,000 dollars saved by middle school and high school students in Southern Oregon. I, you know, that's uh, a lot of savings. That's a lot of savings for for minors, you know, youth uh, who are still in school. They're working these jobs whenever they can. And so um, uh, that that is just impressive to me. Um, and then in the career build program, uh, here is some of the work that we did with uh, students, you know, providing them with those paid internships occupational trainings, um, and and then of those youth who started in career build as out of school youth, 93% of them had, have re-engaged in school. <clears throat> and then this is just a graphic, which is impossible to read, but uh, <laughs> uh, just to give you some idea of what all went on this last summer, we call it the summer of yes. I don't know what we'll call next summer, maybe the summer of absolutely or summer of no brainer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we we had a lot going on this last summer, 325 summer experiences. Um, a lot of students had those paid internships over the summer and, and did uh, professional trainings. And um, yeah, uh, I also just really quickly want to point out, if you didn't know, uh, we up until a couple of years ago, we, we never had our own building. We didn't have our own home. Our home was really your home. We, our staff were working out of the schools that, that where we're contracted to work. Uh, but this the, uh, two years ago, we were able to uh, purchase and raise the funds to move into our own permanent home, a stone's throw from here, right on, on the corner of 7th and School. Carl and I walked here <laughs> from the office. Yes. Yeah, and, and so it's, a, it, it's another wonderful thing for me to be able to, uh, as I step down from this role, to, to, to see that our, our new home right here next to, to GP and, um, <clears throat> and just to continue that, that, that relationship. Um, so I think I'll 
stop there. I don't know if you want to. I'll emphasize one point. Yeah. You caught what Kirk was saying about the scholarship sixth through 11th grade. So yes, that potentially your students from sixth grade, seventh, all the way, they can keep getting scholarships year after year. So they can really be building their scholarship fund before they even get to having an IDA, a plus account. Um, I mean, there's just so many different ways to help students as they get ready to go to college or get into a career. It's, it's just a fantastic model, but I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Every student you see receive a scholarship on scholarship night uh, from Project Youth Plus that they have an account in their name at the Redwood Foundation, which is also at our building over here on Seventh School. And, um, and that money is there waiting for them uh, when they figure out what comes next, what comes after high school. And, um, and you know, this, this, that, I think that, that particular activity, it was based on research that says if a student has an up to, up to, not, not over, up to $500 saved for college, uh, they are low income and first generation college bound students are three times as likely to enroll in college if they have just just even you know a minimal amount of savings for it um so uh and yeah that's uh, i'll just stop right there and, and see if you have any questions i want to ask something because i work for project youth plus but we also i was, I was hoping to direct yeah. to you that you so um i i really feel in my heart that a student if they have a barrier it's coming from their parents and we help students out, especially in Josephine County, we don't have a agency that works with undocumented families like Medford does. So Project Youth Plus has carried on that role. And, um, and I love being able to pair up, like last week, pairing up with Mr. Lingo, reaching out to me about a family that we were able to help. And we actually got a donation from House of Glory to, to raffle off an item so we can give them the cash money to help them you know, assist them with their barriers. So that's one of the biggest things that I, that I love about this program because we just don't help the student, we also help the parents. And having the parents support is huge because the student just kind of follows right after that, you know, doing better in school for us because they say, wow, you helped my family out and you helped us, you know, achieve this. So it's a great program. Can you speak a little bit about the uh, enrollment process? How does a young man or young woman enroll and what are the criteria? And you know, we obviously have quite a number that have applied and have mm -hmm. been enrolled, but what is the enrollment process look like? Excuse me. So it's a little different uh, for those two programs. College Plus is really based on the term we use is risk factors, but th there should be a better term for this, but real life challenges. And we are able to, to, to glean that information from the, the student data uh, that's, that's available. And so we kind of do an initial screening that goes through and identifies, you know, who are the students who are academically on track, but based on what we can see about their life situation <clears throat> and based on research that tells us how these populations will fare without some additional support, these are the students where, where there, there's really a risk uh, that without additional support, they, they might experience opportunity gaps. And so we compile lists like this at each of the schools uh, where we work, and then our staff will bring the, those lists to the schools and, and sit down with, it's kind of different at each school, whether you're talking to the principal or some of the counseling staff, or perhaps the person working at the front desk to say, okay, so, you know your students better than we do. We're, we're going on what's in the database, but look at this and tell us, you know, are there students on here who um, maybe they, in the database, it seems like they, they have some real challenges and need support, but you know that they're, they do not, uh, that they have all the support they need at home. So, okay, so they don't really need to be on this list. And then who are you hoping to see on this list um, that where, you know, maybe they don't quite get flagged, you know, in our screening process, but, you know that that they really need that extra support, and and then through that process we come up with the the, the right list, and and then we approach those students. We invite them um, <clears throat> to sit down with one of our advisors, explain the program, and you know give them a, a sheet that explains it, and, and invite them to, to take it home and, and speak with the parents about it, 
and also our staff will follow up with the parents. <clears throat> so that's for College Plus. Whatever it takes is the more, the, the, the referrals are more coming from the district. It's the district uh, really, you know, identifying the, those students who are needing more support, whether they're credit deficient or chronically absent, things like that. They're needing more support to get across the finish line. <clears throat> So you have a 99% success rate I saw with whatever it takes program. So we should have enrolled every one of our students into whatever it takes. Is that what Our advisors can only take so many on them. Come on now, Brenda. <laughs> well, so Scott brings up a very good point. One that we have talked about at the board level years past when it was college dreams there you didn't serve all the students that we had available through your screening program so how many students are not being served today that have would would make it through your screening program that's a really good question um and I don't have the answer off the top of my head, uh, but we or do I? Uh, yeah, but we we will we'll check that out, and because we, we can we can look at our lists. So, you know those kind of so initial lists we come up with, and find out how many ended up actually what, being served. What is your barrier from being <clears throat> able to serve all of those students? Two barriers. Uh, one is that a lot of the grant funds that we received that that we braid together with the district contract dollars um, are, are for very specific populations. Um, and all, almost all are, are very specifically for low income. Um, so, so we do have eligibility criteria like that. Um, and um, in addition, it's it works because of that the funding, you see all the, the funding coming from the different sources. And so we're, we're able to make it work this way because um, the district is able to, you know, provide a certain amount and we braid it with other funding. If if the district said, okay, we, we want to double our contract and double the number of students served, we would say, wonderful. And, and I believe in, you know, the Grants Pass School District, we could, there are enough students. The, the need is there. Um, but we would also need, it would take time to ramp up to that because we would need to secure the other grant funding and, and things that that to match to the, the, the school district contract, um, just because it, it is just a, a part of, you know, so- And address staffing. Yes, yeah. So, um, we have the, well, <coughs> so back- participate in the program? Yeah, that's true. We we do have to participate. You have a number that say no. Yes. Yeah. Right. We're not talking about those. We're talking about <laughs> the ones that would want participate. To. Yeah. So, a number of years ago, half a dozen or so, back when it was still college dreams, um, there were enough students. The reason college dreams didn't take more is because the district didn't fund more. And so I think I'm hearing you say today that even if the district funded more, there's not enough other pieces for you to take more of those students that fit that criteria. Unless, yeah, yeah I, unless somehow the district would be able to sort of foot the bill for the total cost, um, which which would just be if you're looking at kind of how much the contract is compared to how many staff are there, how many students are being served. Um, the total cost is a lot more than uh, than the, the portion covered by the school district. So, so that's in a, and and we have done that. You know, we we have we have uh, charter schools. You know, that we've started up at like kind of halfway through the year, and in those in that situation, they say, you know, we, we want to get one of your staff in here now. And we say, okay, uh, to, to do that, we got to we have to ask you for you know for the six months or nine months to really cover the full cost. Um, uh, so. That's that's it. I mean, it's it's not an insurmountable barrier, um, but uh, yeah, it our our funding picture is a complicated beast, <laughs> and um, and so yeah, that that it, that does end up kind of being a limiting factor. So what are we contracted now to provide as a district? I 
believe it's 116,000 a year. And how many children, students does that serve? <laughs> Roughly 450. Across a, and that's of our students? Yes. Okay. And again, that's that's in the that's junior high, high school, high school. And, the, and the middle schools in Gladiola. So <clears throat> we have certain goals that we're trying to attain, but they can't be satisfied in a single year. Mm -hmm. Like if we're trying to hit certain graduation targets, we might have to spend money six years in advance of seeing us attain that goal. But so we kind of need to see what kind of numbers it does take for those students who are willing to participate in the program, because if the data is still holding true as it was back then, those students are actually in the district longer. In other words, if they're not in your program, there's some number of them that drop out and you lose them several years before they complete. Okay. If they're in that program, then they stay longer or complete, which actually brings more dollars to the district, but it's six years in the future. So, okay. That'd be something for the superintendent and the budget committee to work on. Will be. Yes, we'll we'll be. Be. We, do, we welcome that, that conversation, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for all you've done all these years. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, and I, I just quickly want to point out, you know, when I when I came into this role as the new director, uh, Rich Ward, who was a longtime uh, board member here with you, uh, was also the president of the board for College Dreams, and um, he was a great mentor to me, uh, and he really helped me understand how special this district is. I'm not, I swear, I'm not just saying <laughs> and, and I think the, the, it really came home to me the first time I went to scholarship night, uh, but just to understand the level of com commitment among this whole community uh, to support these these students uh, is, is really, uh, you know, it, it kind of bruises my ego as a South Medford graduate, but um, uh, it, I, it's just, it's been really wonderful to experience that, to witness it, and I'm very excited for Carl uh, to, to carry on there. And I grew up here, and I graduated college twice here, Southern Oregon. Sock, if you remember Sock. <laughs> um, and I I love Southern Oregon. And that's so why I spent all that time in Klamath Falls. And I like an organization that is reaching out to as many kids as we possibly can. Sounds like resources to me. Um, so we can get over that. Well, let's have at it. Let's help even more more students. My wife and I love doing things in the community. This, I, I'm so happy that I'm going to be able to continue the work that he's done and the rest of the staff is still doing. I'll be looking forward to working with all of you and seeing you around. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Enjoy your Thank evening. you. Right. 4.3 Health Program Science <laughs> Program <laughs> Study Updates. All right, guys, good evening. Um, thank you for having us. We're really happy to be here to talk about the changes for our health science pathway. Uh, my name is Petra Nye. I'm the lead. Um, this is Taylor DeHari. We're both your health science teachers for Grants Pass High School, uh, 9 through 12. We have five courses. I invited some of our um, HOSA students. HOSA stands for Health Occupation Student Association. So it's an organization that benefits students in the uh, workplace and health occupations. So I have Caden, who's our president, and I have Alyssa, who's our second president. I wanted to invite them just to kind of give a student a hand here. Should we have any questions that a students could explicitly answer for us? So, uh, yeah, we'll get started. Additionally, uh, we're also both licensed and active paramedics in the Valley. Yes. 
Yes. If you see us out in the field, it is not ironic. We <laughs> have careers. multiple careers. Um, we're both licensed paramedics in this county. I also work for Asante and uh, RCC. So when you guys go somewhere else, you will also cannot get away from me. Um, <laughs> Taylor also spent at least a year over at um, the veterinary emergency clinic. So she's there. Yeah, yes. she's bringing in additional experience just from a whole new perspective. So we have a lot of hats. You're going to see us around. It's not weird. We're not following you. <laughs> we have actual other places to be. Um, here's our agenda. I wanted to keep it really short and sweet. Um, just briefly touch on the current pathway, talk about what we wanted to change, why we want to change it, and then open up questions at the end and hopefully have enough time and not take too much of yours. Um, all of our changes that we're doing fall in line with all of our current standards in um, health sciences. We are following our CCT and our NICHI, NCHSE. Uh, Oregon Department of Education recognizes all of these as our current and approved <laughs> standards. All right, here's our traditional pathway. We've got five courses. They're uh, semester long. We get a uh, 0.5 health credit for each of these courses. We've got emergency care, body works, basic medicine, advanced medical skills, and advanced wilderness. This is the current pathway. It's been this way for at least 10, maybe, maybe even longer. Um, the changes that we're going to suggest are our two last classes. These are our advanced courses. So this will be affecting predominantly our juniors and seniors. And the why? Well, medicine is constantly evolving. It's constantly changing. Half of what we learn in our programs of study, even at post-secondary, is technically wrong before we even graduate. We learn that yeah, medications fall into favor and out of favor almost every year. We go to school and learn one way, graduate, and find that it's already changed before we even had a chance to practice medicine. So, we need to be doing that for our students here in school. We need to be constantly updating curriculum and changing all of our skill set, how we do things. The benefit of doing this is that with every change that medicine makes and healthcare makes, creates more opportunities for students to gain employment in the industry. More jobs are being created almost every year. And if we can quickly catch these and you know bring these into our pathway, we're going to increase employability for the industry. We're going to increase exposure and really just maximize your student opportunity. All right, here's what we're suggesting. We're gonna keep emergency care, body works, basic medical skills, all that the same. We wanna change the two advanced courses and what we're suggesting is adding medical terminology <laughs> and advanced medical skills is gonna be changed in its um, priority. So it's gonna be the last class and we're gonna change a lot of the curriculum data. This change would also replace advanced wilderness, right? So we would be replacing advanced wilderness with medical terminology and changing the structure of how it's set aside. Okay, medical terminology. It's the language of medicine. We speak it all the time in our field. We speak it so oftenly, often that we forget we're even speaking a second language, but technically we are predominantly Latin and Greek. If students are gonna be in this industry, they're going to have to speak this language. They're gonna have to understand this language. We suggest including this course in our pathway and offering a dual credit through RCC for medical terminology. What this will do for students is knock off a prerequisite for any program they're going to take throughout college. It'll save them money, it'll save them time. They're gonna get this exposure and this education early. And when we place them in job shadows and in internships, they're already gonna have the benefit of knowing the language. They're gonna listen to a nurse giving another nurse a handoff and be able to understand the language that they're speaking. This is going to maximize their job shadow time. We already are articulated through RCC. We offer dual credit classes through RCC already. So this is already a relationship that makes sense. We can be offering this to them right now. And this is not a transfer or an elective credit. This goes for medical terminology. So nursing, paramedic, massage therapy, any career they want in medicine, this is going to take a prerequisite off their plate. It'll save them about $700 in an entire semester of school. Pretty good. And additionally, it's a good option even if students ultimately choose not to go into healthcare um, because it not only does it teach a language skill, which is very helpful, but it does transfer as elective credits for other associate's degrees as well. Right. And you use this in the, you know, with all the at veterinary medicine. Yes. Right? Like it's just a lot of transfer. Yeah. It, it, it touches everything. 
All right, advanced medical skills. So I wanted to update and add a lot to the curriculum. We're going to add medication administration, add more sub-Q, IM, IN. Uh, these are all methods in which we administer medication in the field. Adding pharmacology, basically just an intro to pharmacology, advanced airways, medical math, advanced cardiology, and updated medicals such as sepsis. This probably all sounds like a different language to you already when I'm telling you about this, but this is the current latest and greatest currently in the medical field right now. Additionally, we can add certificates for employability such as EKG tech. EKG tech is one of those jobs that kind of just became a hot new job within the last three to five years. And this is something that high school students can obtain here and go work in the field and make, you know, 19 to 20 something an hour at, fresh out of high school. So. Uh, we're really excited. Our entire goal here is to create more student, you know, opportunities. And when we can add certificates that will get them out in the industry working, that really excites us because that's where we're here. Additionally, with this curriculum, um, all the things that we have mentioned already are things that both Petra and I are qualified to teach. It would require no additional training on our parts. We already have licensure and education to teach things such as EKG certification. Um, and Petra has also been in contact with some training centers about yeah. making mutually beneficial relationships to help get our students certified. Right. So as she's saying, we can already teach this. We just have to go through a few extra hoops to be able to certify in that. Mm -hmm. But the NHA, as I added at the bottom, is known as the National Health Association. They're the ones who issue certificates and that we would need to become proctors for. Um, we've been in communication with that. So it doesn't sound like it's that far out of reach. I wanted to kind of show some of the local support that we've had. Um, one of the questions that came up during the parental advisory meeting was, how are you guys able to do this at such a low cost? This is how. I I'm up to my eyeballs in superglottic airways and IV fluids <laughs> and, and medical devices that they're just pouring out to us because they know that we're dealing with students. I have boxes of laryngoscopes and IO drills. Like this is thousands of dollars worth of stuff that they just said, oh, you're doing something awesome with students, here you go. And this was the first place I reached out to, and I'm on box seven of donations. <laughs> so, you know, the, the community wants it, the students love it. We've got a lot of support here. We've, we've got a lot of passion for this field. We both know this like the back of our hand, and we're just so excited to come share this with students and, and kind of, you know, spread this enthusiasm. We have a ton of local support. Also, Petra and I both, since we are active paramedics in the field, have a lot of local contacts. Mm -hmm. A lot of our local agencies are very excited at these new prospects. It really does give students a leg up in any kind of medical field. And as we know right now, the current climate, we are short on healthcare workers of all kinds. So our local community members, community partners are super excited about this potential. Yeah, yeah. They see future healthcare providers and the right, the right to think that. Um, this is the first of many changes. You're going to see us a lot. You're going to hear us a lot because medication, you know, medicine is always evolving. Healthcare is evolving and changing. We have a lot of things that we want to add here and make awesome. So in the future, potentially, we could align Body Works, which is the second class, with RCC to offer more dual credit. Mm -hmm. Additionally, if, I, if we can partner with the NHA, which we very much plan to do so, they also offer phlebotomy certificates. So it could be in the future that we have two separate pathways, one of EKG tech, one of FLEB, that kind of just breaks off from the advanced course. And I don't know what that would look like as far as time or semester or, or whatnot, but these are, these are industry certificates that get kids out in the work field. And that is what we're about, increasing employability skills. So students can go post-secondary, jump into college and have a skill that gives them clinical exposure, or they can take a moment and work a little bit. And, and gain that exposure that way. So we'll be here a lot. We'll be here often. <laughs> Hopefully we don't, you guys don't get tired of us. Um, this is our information. You can call us, you can email us. You can pop in and come watch our classrooms and just be part of the fun. You know, you might, you might see a little stuff. You haven't signed a syllabus. So you might see a little explicit medical uh, imagery, but it's a lot of fun. We have we have a great time, and we wanted to open open this up for questions. But I have a feeling that there might be some. Well, I am so impressed. <laughs> so, Thank you. This is awesome. I don't know. Is this gonna 
take away training from the students that were training for green chain. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to say that the ability for some of our students to get certificates as they graduate from high school has been, I guess, a board goal, at least a personal goal. Um, students here in District 7, because clearly the students are able. Um, we have some barriers having to do with certificates come from RCC and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it looks like oh, yeah. you're working to solve those kind of issues. Um, I'm only wondering if we're going to have some difficulties. I can see students wanting more of these classes, but being restricted because of requirements from the state that they have classes in certain categories. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be something for we'll work on that. We'll work on that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. but at any rate, really exciting presentation. Mm -hmm. Brenda, I really like the fact that students can actually, I mean, it used to be a long time ago. You got your high school diploma. And that was a certificate to go get a job, mm -hmm. but that's not really the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. no, I, you're absolutely a great point. We we offer as much certificates as we can to get kids out there, to get them, because that's where the learning takes place, right? We can teach them a lot, we can practice skills, but getting them out there exposed in the clinical environment is where a lot of learning takes place. We both can advocate for that because we were students thrown into a paramedic internship for three months. And that's where the rubber really met the road as far as, you know, pharmacology and didactic information. Like that's where, where we started to practice medicine. Um, our students get uh, BLS certified, CPR certified, they get first aid certified. So the, the most, the more we can do, the better opportunity they have, the more chance they have. And so that's really all we can do for them and encourage them and support them and, you know, and it is our goal to be able to offer these certifications in-house and not have to go through an outside agency right. like RCC. So we can eliminate the middleman kind of streamline it for our students. Good point. That that way drops the cost for students. A, a, a BLS AHA CPR certificate costs $60 to be certified. Like $200 for the class if you take that to RCC. Students get it here for free. Absolutely. If they come in through our first class and, and can meet those standards, that's free for them. That makes them more money as a babysitter. They can go into a health club and make more money. Lifeguards. Lifeguards. This is this is a huge leg up with just the first class in our pathway. So we are all about finding these opportunities and adding these in and encouraging students and getting them exci as excited as we are about this. Now, this is this is what it's about. Um, did you guys have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't want to put you on the spot, but, you know. You're both totally excited for these changes, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. personally invested. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. I think it'll be nice to um, take medical terminology before you uh, go to um, college, because I know it could be quite rigorous there. Absolutely. The benefits of taking it here with me is we've got a few more weeks. So we have, it's not a quarter, we have semesters. So we have a few more weeks. We can stretch it out a little bit. We can create more interaction and more collaboration with it. You know, in college, it's here. Here's a list of 2,000 words. Know this, and you get no notes on a test, you get no test retakes, you get no help, build your own resources. Right. Yeah, come here, take it here. We're gonna do PowerPoints, we're gonna do exercises, we're gonna have fun with it. You know, we both know this, you know, back and forth, up and down. So, you know, I think it'll be better for our students. To take care of this. So you guys are, what, when you introduced them, what? Yeah, so Kaden is my host of president, also health science student, and Alyssa is the, Post of secretary, also health science. So the what what do you guys do as the president secretary? What do you guys do? Um, in HOSA, yeah. we organize um, field trips. We also organize the CERT program at our school, which is the um, the final for the kid class. They go out to um, the firehouse and um, exhibit the skills that they have learned over the year. Um, we organize it all. There's about um, I think 30 students. Um, we had our cert just about a month ago. We went there, set up, um, helped the teachers um, to uh, help the freshman test. But other than that, we um, we organized field trips. 
And I believe there is like some state competitions mm -hmm. that might be a possibility in the future for OSA, um, because I believe that it's a national organization. Yes. Yeah. So my job as a secretary is primarily note-taking, but that note-taking is for us to keep track of what we've done, like what we need to do, and what's already accomplished. And pretty much that just keeps us on track to be as most, most efficient as possible. Then also I'm in charge of getting everybody signed in for the morning meetings, sometimes lunch, so that's up and down. Um, we also have an organizer that's a level below me that is really in charge and keeping me yeah, and she in charge. Yeah, she keeps all of us in charge. And I also act as a third voice because obviously the vice president's above me, but to Caden and also this is I to make sure we get what we want and also be the voice of the students within HOSA and also our CTE pathway. Yeah, HOSA is kind of my first choice for like when we Asante reaches out and wants Christmas trees decorated mm -hmm. or the local optometrist wants kids for visual exams or fire uh, you know Hillcrest fire department blood pressure clinics mm -hmm. Hillcrest fire department reaches out they need victims for their annual training oh I've got 30 warm bodies to send you you know <laughs> like this is perfect guess what kids you know you're guess what you're gonna do um we're gonna take a trip to the RCC LA health fair in April which is gonna be a lot of fun we're going to try to take a trip out to Mercy Flights and thank them for all the generous offers that they, you know, so gracefully have given us for our programs. And uh, yeah, just get them out there whenever Valley Media Care reached out. They've got a student internship program that I have yet to uh, get back to them on. But yeah, but so many opportunities in this valley for the young, the dedicated, you know, health aspired individual. And POSA is really like a, a more of a connection for that. And additionally, as Kate said, we have national and state competitions that we're going to probably try to, you know, see what that's about next year. Additionally, just to put it into perspective, all of what they do, we could not put on CERT without oh, this team. No. Just last semester alone, we had 220 students participate in CERT. That's a lot of facilitating, a lot of things going on. Um, and our host of teams really what pulls it together. We would not be able to do it, just two of us. So we really appreciate that for that. 100%. Yeah. CERT is at the end of eCare, as Caden was saying, it's our final for our first intro class. It stands for Community Emergency Response Team. So our students have been training. They've been CPR, first aid, and now disaster response trained. And so they get to go to Hillcrest Fire Station and practice a disaster drill with fire, with, with firefighters. They put out a real fire and then go use their uh, three-story fire tower to practice carrying each other, triaging each other, uh, doing their first aid on each other. And I could not do this without our host team. We could not do this without our host team. You know, they're out there in the field, in, you know, in their vests, making sure that nobody gets really hurt and uh, that everyone's doing this correctly. You know, Taylor and I float around, but between the two of us, we just could not do this without them. It also caters quite a lot of respect from our yeah. intro students. They get to see what the host team gets to participate in. It makes them really excited about this pathway. Our oh, pathway yeah. is super student driven. A lot of these changes were incited by our current students. 100%. I really appreciate you guys being here tonight. Yeah. Yes. Thank yeah. you very much. Yes. Thank you. And email us, call us if you have questions, come in and pop into our class. Absolutely. You know, we love to We want to show you what we're doing. That's nice. Yeah. Thank you for expanding on today. And as excited as I'm in here, graduation rate, I'm on a five minute break. <laughs> What's that?
All right. Reconvening general session. Um, item 4.4, graduation night, Director Evans. Yeah, we just wanted to take a minute. We know um, you saw the uh, graduation rates come out January 26th. This is our first board meeting since then to kind of highlight our improved graduation requirement, uh, our improved graduation rate. You know, this is a superintendent goal. It's part of our district improvement goal. It's kind of all culminates in students getting across that finish line. It's for a number of presentations already that have talked about getting students there that all leads towards these numbers. Um, the first page that you have that's projected up there is district-wide data. Um, looking at the all students category uh, for our graduation rate, we increased as a district from um, the year prior, 77.69% to 79.03%. It's not one and a half percent gain and our completion rate increased by about 3%. If we really look at all of this data to identify subpopulations and, and how they're doing, um, you know from past board reports, we pay attention to our students with disabilities, our Hispanic, our EL, as well as our homeless population. And we saw some gains in each one of those categories and some things that we need to continue to work on as a district. The graphs, the next couple of pages, the four-year cohort graduation completer rate. This is the first year. If you want to roll, roll to that for me, Pete. Um, this is the first year that we have separated out GP Flex and Gladiola High School from Grants Pass High School's data. That's why you see uh, multiple data points in the 21-22 school year. Um, so as we start to see the trends, um, we'll follow those. You'll, the state grad rate was also added, um, was asked by a board member that we put these into graph format so that you can see our uh, trajectory overall. Four-year completer, four-year graduation rates on top, four-year completer rate is on the bottom. Those are students who got it done in four years. But our five-year rate, if you go to the next one, you don't see Gladiola and GP Plex on this one because last year was their first year as an institution. So this is just Grants Pass High School and Grants Pass School District. Next year, you'll see five-year data for Gladiola and for GP Plex. Um, but again, here, proud of the gains we're making. Um, please pay attention mostly to that five-year cohort completer rate on the bottom. 88.99%. We are almost to that 90% mark of our students um, graduating or earning a GED uh, in five years. And it takes uh, it takes some students a little bit extra time. And that's what that data represents. The last chart we have for you is the dropout rate. It's important not to confuse this data with uh, like the graduation rate, because this represents students in grades nine through 12 who dropped out during the course of the school year. Um, some of those students we might get back next year, they might actually graduate in the four or five years. So the, the two sets of data that the state reports on are not quite, quite aligned to each other. Um, so our dropout rate, we monitor it throughout the school year. We try to recover students and get them back into school. Um, and last year, uh, that's why you see so many dots. We have GD Flex and Gladiola's data in there as well. And that is our graduation rate information. Any questions or comments? So the dropout rate is freshman through senior? Yeah. And it's just for that one academic year that they left some time in that year and did not return by the start of the next school year. Okay. Not just returning to our school, but never, never enrolled in any school that we've been so notified if, of or know about. Yeah. So if we were their last school, we would be responsible for their dropout. Yes. 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 And then on the data on the graph on the very first page, the N for all the 106, 416, which is the completion rate, but that's just the seniors that doesn't take into account the dropout. Right. Um, that's not the cohort size. I realized as I was looking at that for he's talking about this set of data. The cohort size 
is uh, based on who entered their freshman year four years ago and completed and, and the cohort is includes those kids who didn't complete or dropped out and then those who continued on. So the four. So the, the end size is bigger than the 392 and the 416, the, the cohort size. That's the actual number that earned their diploma and earned their GED. Right. So that, that's my question. So from, from the graduating class, those seniors, do we know how many started out as front? How many kids do we lose in the four years? Yeah. I, that's what yep. the dropout rate really yep. is. It's about it's, it's about It's about 70 kids. 70 kids. Yeah. But they don't get included in the final graduation tally, or do they? No, Is they're that... they're the they're the twenty thirty percent that didn't make it. And so we're we we that's that's my question. So we base that number based on the total number of freshmen that started. For graduation rate, correct. For the for that year, right? Okay. That's why they're the dropout rate and the grad rate are not right. the same thing. Um, we have had talks on the homeless population amongst the students in the past, and so we have 26 and 33 for this year. That seems lower than what we've talked about. Is that a pretty accurate number? And we only have four foster students. Is that right in the whole graduating class? Mm -hmm. that, no, that's not that. Again, because that is like, hold on, let me, I should have. So the 26 is 50 percent, but it was actually 452 homeless kids. The 26 is the per, is the number that actually graduated. graduated. So 50% graduated, that means 50% did not. So there's another 26. So the, the denominator is 52. Got it. Okay. All right. So the percentage is, so the N is just not the total number. It's just no. the number. Really yeah, it's, it's not the base number. Do you update this with the cohort and essentially just email it out to us? I'm sorry, say that again. Can I update uh, it with what? The cohort. Oh, the, the cohort size. Mm -hmm. Cohort size. Mm -hmm. And email it out. Is that what yeah. you ask? Yeah. Email it. Okay. Do you go? So I see that um, you go back to 17, 18, we don't have any numbers for homeless. We didn't have any, or we weren't counting. Them. I did not hear that. Seventeen, eighteen for homeless. We don't have any foster homeless children listed for the early years of the data. Is mm -hmm. that because we weren't counting them, or we just were didn't have any? Didn't have any. Yeah, foster care is a new collection that the state just started a few years ago. That those dashes are because of how the state was collecting the data. And so there, there wasn't a number there from the state. And now they're collecting the data routinely. Okay. So I would have an additional request yes. to start counting or tracking how many students we have eligible for Project Youth Plus, whether they accept it or not, just track how many there were and then track how many that are in the Project Youth Plus program and what their graduation rates are. So that four or five years from now, we'll be able to see what that program did for us and what the potential of that program could have done for us. I'll see if is that possible. Well, I Garth. think I heard Kurt say he was going to try to get you that data. Um, yes. I would rely on them but, to provide us. That's, you know, that's them. There are what kids. You, we know that whether right. they are harmed. What you're saying is how many kids could have possibly been served because of they met the criteria, met the criteria but weren't served, and we want to track both cohort, cohorts, those that were served and those that weren't served. Correct. Mm -hmm. You can wait year after year. Okay. So we get four or five years to so we can see what the data was. Because okay. I would be interested to know how much money it would cost to expand the program so that as we come into the next budgetary cycles, we can look at that. You know, if we're if our commitment is one hundred and sixteen thousand dollars for four hundred and fifty students mm -hmm. and we should be serving seven hundred students, 
and I recognize that not all the funding comes from us, but what contribution on our end could then help us get access to 750 students or whatever that number is. Um, he said that 99% of their enrollees and their program graduated from high school. Yes. Great. I don't know what they're doing that's so amazing, but whatever we need to do to support something like that so we can see all of these homeless and foster kids and the migrants and whoever else qualifies for that program. I think that's money well spent. If we're going to put our money somewhere, that seems to be a good program. So. Okay. And we'll look at, at that. Uh, I'd be curious to know what that 99% actually represents if they pick the Well, two. me too. I, I'd like a little bit more information. Like if it seems too good to be true, oftentimes it is, but I would like to know. Right. So kind of we track it for a few years, we'll know. Tanya, you're writing all this down. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also, can we put the denominator on here when we do yeah. this data again? Because I think that's what hearings have to do a lot. Right. I mean, the end and the percentage, yep. we should have the total number on there too, just yep. to give us a, an we, idea. We can do that. Excellent. Anybody else? Thank you, Trish. Yes, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. The numbers are improving. So. Yes, they are. Good scene. And the opportunities are improving. We'll go on to the next agenda item, if that's okay. Early college guidelines and procedures. Um, it was, I think it was last board meeting, you had a presentation on audience, and there was a couple of questions from the board related to college experiences for students while they're in, in our school. We've been working on our procedures and guidelines following state guidelines and laws related to um, enrolling kids in school at the same time that they're attending their own community college. Early college is a program that Rogue Community College offers. Um, it is available only to students who are 16 years of age or older and enrolled in 11th or 12th grade. We're working on making sure that our uh, parents and our students are aware of the early college program. Um, we have a number of students participating already this year, and we hope to increase that next year. You see some of the criteria related to uh, a student really has to come with a plan and a drive. Um, students who participate in early college or students who know what their path is and um, can uh, navigate college early on. RCC doesn't allow us to do any of that work for them. I think we have an early college student here who can tell you how difficult it was to navigate RCC. Um, we will cover the cost of tuition and college admission. Um, there are a few things they have, the student has to do on the RCC checklist. And then the, it is possible to be earning credit at the same time, high school credit at the same time they're earning college credit. Um, the second page is our uh, parent agreement form. What we wanna make sure is clear to the student and the parent who take on the challenge of participating in early college is that it's a real commitment on their part. Um, and if they don't complete the course that they have registered for, that they'll um, be responsible for reimbursing the district for the costs associated with the class. So we really wanna make sure students have a plan going in and that they are successful um, in our early college program. We have this right now in our uh, cor course catalog and we'll be putting it on our district website as well so that families know more about it. Counselors are already talking with their students about it um, at both, uh, at all three of our high schools, GP Flex, Gladiola, and Grand's Best High School. All right. And How's early college going for you, Rhea? It is going well so far. I'm really liking the flexibility of it, including with like GP Flex I'm doing. I have about two courses I'm doing online and I am going to RCC Tuesdays and Thursdays from one to like, to 50 ish. It's going well so far. I just finished up with the midterm last Thursday. Great. Good news. All right. Thank you, Trish. Are there any questions? Thank you. 
Okay, 4.6 VCS. Colleges to restrooms, here we go. <laughs> uh, Thank so you for waiting. I think the board's aware that we've been working on a project uh, since last spring when it was approved for ESSER dollars to do a redesign of our second very school bathrooms. The big idea is that people have choice. And so with the redesign, it's our hope that students can choose from traditional bathroom settings to a new bathroom that I'm gonna let them talk about and even self-contained bathrooms um, so that there's choices for students to feel as safe and secure as possible at school. So anyway, uh, Jake is online. And so I think he's gonna help do some of our uh, presentation for us. And then you're gonna do the rest, right? Yeah, Stephen. So, um, are we going to have Jake first? Is that how this works? Um, so I think I'll just give kind of a brief introduction. Um, so I'm Stephen Chase. I'm a project manager with ZCS Engineering and Architecture. Uh, I got involved on this project uh, with my experience with Three Rivers doing something similar at their high schools and their middle schools. So it was a good fit for me to join the team on this one. Uh, Jake is our uh, lead architect on the project. He's out of Portland. He couldn't make it down here today, so he's joining us on Zoom. Um, pass out a few of the floor plan layouts of the proposed restroom renovations to the board and some of the members um, of the community. So Jake is going to do a screen share and walk us through the, um, the why. And some of the goals that we learned on recent projects for this are how do we balance safety, security, and privacy for the students? And so Jake's going to talk about those points and the intent behind the design and our current um, progress on the drawings and where we're at. And once he wraps up that presentation, I'll talk about our next steps for the school board and the district, moving this forward into construction for the summer. Thanks for the instruction. Um, sorry again, I couldn't be um, physically there tonight, but happy to talk with you and answer any questions that you have about the project. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Good deal. Um, so again, just to reiterate uh, what Stephen is talking about, you know, we talk we talk about these as being all inclusive restrooms, and sometimes there gets to be a little bit of politics that uh, gets mixed in with this. But the main focus of this is safety and security. And what we've found um, with these new restroom layouts is kids feel more comfortable. Um, kind of behind their own private closed door. You know, you can remember um, going to school yourself and having that eighth inch gap between um, the partition doors. And back in our day, I mean, my high school didn't even have doors on the stalls, um, <laughs> which is just craziness. The ADA ones did, and that was the only ones that ever got used. But um, back in our day, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have cameras. And now um, your little camera can stick between that little gap in the bathrooms. Um, and with all the revenge stuff going around online, kids get really nervous. Um, the other thing is there's most of the bathrooms are behind closed doors. And it just creates an opportunity for bullying and harassment inside that space, especially with a single gender using that space. Um, I have, um, we've completed a couple of these projects and in those communities, um, the facilities directors have um, expressed to us how they've had kids that just won't use the bathroom all day. And now that they have these environments, they're comfortable enough, um, which of course helps with learning. Because if the kid is trying to hold it or uncomfortable all day, it just is another distraction for them. Um, so let's just dive into our layouts, unless there's any initial questions he wants to pose. Now let's see if I can make the technology work, right? Should be an option on the bottom of your screen for a screen share. If not, we might have to add you as a presenter. Oh, yeah. 
I think I can do scene three. Here we go. All right. Can everyone see that okay? <clears throat> um, so we'll start with uh, Grants Pass High School. Um, and currently, there's um, two separate restrooms in this area. Um, the solution for this, um, well, and one thing that the board has requested is that every one of these restroom groups has um, private restrooms available as well. So if a kid doesn't feel um, comfortable um, in the mixed environment, they do have the option to go to a single user restroom um, that has its own sink, toilet, and the works. Um, the other thing that we found with doing these is the teachers really love them because if um, they can't quite make it to the staff bathroom, there is a private bathroom um, down the hall from their classrooms. So that's what this is indicating here. Um, one of the solutions is we try and make that opening into the bathroom as big as possible. That gives clearer line of sight for staff, teachers, and just either other students to just notice if something uh, nefarious is going on in that space. Um, so in these spaces, each one has a two by four framed wall with sheathing, the whole works. Um, we're proposing wall hung toilets. Um, these are great because we can mop underneath of them kind of the larger space behind these stalls. Um, an ADA stall, an ambulatory stall, and then um, we find a lot of efficiencies with these uh, trough sinks. Um, we have a single uh, plumbing connection instead of having multiple plumbing connections. Um, the planning department is requiring that we meet um, the plumbing uh, one for one. So we have as many toilets in sinks as there were originally in the school and fit them into this facility. Um, the front of the doors right now we're proposing to be um, toilet partition material. The new po toilet partitions, um, the frames are rabbited. Um, at the opening, so when they close, there's no clear line of sight. And then um, we spec a piano hinge on the hinge side. So again, there's no clear line of sight. Um, we find that the bathroom partition for the front is a more durable material. Um, there's just it's easier to maintain if something goes wrong, and it's a little more cost effective um, in the end. Um, we like to spec, let's see if I can find the right handle. So we like to spec a little bit of a more uh, durable handle than just the little slides that you would normally see in those partitions. So it's more like a residential handle um, with an occupancy indicator. You know if somebody is in there. Um, these all will be on um, spring hinges, so they'll spring mostly closed. They'll just be a little like inch gap that they'll hold open. So if you worry about these being in the way, that is the solution for that. Um, there's no questions on uh, Grants Pass High Jake, I didn't, we didn't on. get pictures of the material. Can you blow up? Can you go back to what is the door material made up of again? Um, so we like to spec a, it's a plastic material, it's recycled, and there's lots of options, let me find that again. Um, so there's lots of options. Um, it's the same material that like a plastic cutting board is made out of, um, and one of the benefits to it, A, it's recyclable, very durable, um, it's super cleanable, and the other nice thing is if somebody takes a knife and tries to carve something into it, um, all you have to do is take a lighter and like a back of a spoon and 
heat up the material and you can buff out. Um, oh, well, there we go. That's right. what we were. Thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think Jake, my, so, my question, my question really is, as I'm looking at the pictures, the the doors do not go down to the floor. So, is there still a space underneath, or do are these? Because on the on the drawing there, it seems to go down to the floor, and that's that's my question. As we're talking about safety and privacy, do they go down to the floor? Is this an enclosed space, or are these just dividers like we typically see in a bathroom? Yeah, they are an enclosed space. So these are just kind of showing typical ones, but um, there's an inch gap at the bottom just because we need that uh, mostly for airflow because each toilet stall will have its own exhaust hood. So you're sucking air under the door and up, but it's only an inch. Um, and then they'll go all the way to the top. And then the walls between, these are framed walls. So these are two by four stud walls, bottom to top. Um, we typically put the ceiling height in these stalls at eight feet so that the ductwork can run through them. The other thing is if you do decide to add vape sensors to these stalls, the vape sensors like a smaller base be more accurate. Otherwise, sometimes it takes a second for them to read if it was in there. I'm not quite sure if you guys are using vape sensors yet. We need a semi view list to chat with you guys about. So on the doors uh, being full height, there is an option to, because we need that ventilation, each individual stall has its own individual vent pulling the air out. So there's two ways to approach that. You either have the gap at the bottom, which does pose some risk that you could slide a foam under. So there's a safety security issue there. You can put loopers in the bottom of these doors. Now you're balancing a bit of the durability with the safety. Um, and you can angle those louvers down so that you, you can't even see into there. So that is an option. Um, right now, this is just the, the direction that we have, and we'll be having further discussions with the board and Dan and everybody looking at this district side of what do we want to balance here? Because there is some price associated and there's some benefits on the security and the privacy side. Um, other materials, um, usually we spec a sheet good for the flooring that's welded. Um, we prefer a tile at the back of the sink just to take any splatter. Um, but we haven't quite gotten into that level of detail um, with the district yet. But there's lots of opportunities to express school color in the tile and the finishes. So red wasn't the only option for the doors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So many options. Half my uh have the challenge in my job <laughs> to land on one. Um if there's no questions on this one, we'll move on to the next. Yeah. I think we have we have someone that has a question. Okay. Is this just in one building in the high school, and then one building in the north, and one in south, or yes, is correct. so? Is this just in the main building, central building? So, if someone needed to use this restroom, they would have to walk from one of the other buildings. Mm -hmm. to so the core building, I believe it's that side of the core building. Um, at north, it would be. Uh, where the band room is, there are two bathrooms there, and the south is the one at the end of the main hall um, as you walk in. Is there a reason why south bathroom is so much smaller than north? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's the, the matching the one to one things and, and space available. So. It's because we beat them in basketball so badly. <laughs> so with the extra wide opening, no one point we had talked about half walls or for visibility so, for hand washing. Certainly. Um, 
That's a good question. That, that's something that we balanced working on a few of these other projects as well. Um, one of the biggest things was, so for Three Rivers, the bullying was a big thing in all restroom spaces. There were students, again, to Jake's point, like some of the other districts that were bolded all day because they didn't feel safe. So we balanced how much can staff members see from the hallway? Can they see the entire restroom? So what we have there is uh, three entrances. They have these long um, restroom bays. And within those, we also provided some window walls. So you still have mirrors and windows at your sinks, so students can do their makeup, do their hair in the morning, and also still have that visibility off the corridors into those spaces. So that's what we're trying to balance here um, with the size of that opening to still have line of sight through the restroom space, you know, mitigate that bullying potential, heighten that security and the supervision from the district staff side, but then also give you that private, you have an individual toilet stall that you can use, insulated, sound insulated, um, and then you get into the community area of the sinks. So that's where you have the co-mingling potential, um, but that full visibility off of those corridors. Mm -hmm. But certainly an option if we want to add some windows or some half height walls, it's something we can look at. I will say on the high school, we are balancing, there is an existing firewall that cuts through those double doors, goes up, comes over, and then runs down the right-hand side of the page. So modification would have to be on the lower part of the page there to keep our fire separation for code. Yeah, it's mostly this uh, upper section, the firewall follows this. So you've mentioned that you worked with Three Rivers. Is there a project complete? We are working through the um, construction. Uh, so we went CMGC, which is what I'll discuss uh, at the end of this. Um, they're working through their GMP, their guaranteed maximum price. Right now we're negotiating some potential alternates uh, with those, but um, they're slated to start over spring break with their projects. And have you guys worked with anybody else in our area? Um, I haven't personally, but I know that there have been a few um, restroom renovations in Central Point. Um, but I think those were just a wonderful one. I don't think they went with the um, privacy for all standard. It was just a minute. We're trying to see what that question is. Nope. There's nothing there. So. Zoom question. There's nothing. There. Last question. Okay. Yeah, Mark. Good. Are you are you done? Are you good? Oh, no. Was there oh, any more? no. <laughs> no, there's no, no questions. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, well, let's move on to South Middle. Um, this is a much larger space. Um, you know, a new school, I think there, this would be kind of the goal is to have this much of an opening um, from the hall. Um, so this was nice that we were able to do this. Um, again, we were able to add a single user private um, stall um, for toilets and um, for sinks. Well, um, again, this one will have wall hung toilets. And I think the disparity there, sorry, Jake, is because maintenance needs to still have some space as well. <laughs> cutting into their um, room a little bit. But it's still and the same one. For one. one for one still, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and it, the the bathroom is a current bathroom in here, um, but it's more like a janitorial uh, bathroom. So okay. now we've enlarged it and made it open to the hallway. And then last is North Middle School. Now this one was a little trickier. Um, I think if we would challenge the building department, we could reduce the plumbing count, but that's a whole hassle. 
go through. So this was a little tighter to get all the toilets. Um, this building is access from the exterior. So these are exterior doors. Um, so I do think that we talked about adding some windows in here. Okay. Yes, we did. So we'll add um, windows in here. The doors will, uh, these doors into them will be three quarter windows. So we'll leave a solid part for about two feet on the bottom. So kids can, you know, kick the doors open as they do and not break the glass. So they, there will be visibility in the doors. Um, we can put them on hold opens so that when the days are nice, we can um, leave them open. Um, Again, we have one single user restroom that's access from the outside and then um, <coughs> our series of stalls. This one is a little tighter um, and this one is on a well. So we will be um, using pressure assist tank toilets. Um, and we found a model that has a locking lid because um, kids hide things in toilets, I guess. <laughs> one one comment we had on the early projects was kids were hiding big pens in the toilets that had tanks. So with this being not well and not enough water pressure around those flushometers, having a locking lid that only maintenance can open. I need clarification. Are we on north or south? North. 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 So north is on a well. This one's on north. As well as well? Is it? <laughs> yeah, I don't think they are. South, right? is, south is on a well. Yeah. Yeah. Was it south, Jake? South is on. It was south. Yeah. So no pressure assists on north. Right now they're drawn as wall hungs, and that's what we have the space for. A little bit more space on south, so the tank toilets will work. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you for that clarification. The, these ones will be floor mounted pressure. Um, no. Flush <laughs> valve toilets, just because we don't have the room for the hanger. Um, when you do a wall-mounted toilet, you need about a foot um, to support the toilet. So these will be flush valves. Helps prevent clogging. So these are accessed from the outside. I'm just thinking of north. I know where the band rooms are, but it's not the inside hallway. You have to go outside under the overhangs, right, to access these. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this is the outside. Um, I have to have a, a little bit of a model of that. So you access them through here. So we will need a. Um, move some lockers around, but yeah, I really like the open concept on the inside ones. The line of sight, this unfortunately doesn't have that, so I do think putting in some big windows. I mean, that's the whole point, right? Mm -hmm. So and that's why I think it's important to have the doors to go all the way down to the floor. If you're going to have an open concept model, I do kind of struggle a little bit with this even an inch gap because it's not completely private. I, I would like the doors to be more robust. I want the kids to feel like when they go into the restroom and they shut the door, they are safe in there. Um, so those are the things that I, I want, I, I'm looking for. Like, I, I like the open concept. I hope that we will continue with that. I don't know what, what modifications can be made at North, but I really want to see that safety. And I'm looking forward to the day when we talk about redoing locker rooms where we have a big open room for the team to sit and then changing rooms that people can go into and change. Um, because uh, from your experience and my experience in high school, all of the bullying takes place in a locker room and in the restroom. And I was one of the kids that would not go to the bathroom at school. Um, so these are important things, I think, for all the students to feel safe that they can go in, go to the bathroom and not have to worry about it. So. In the locker rooms, we're helping Seaside with a locker room for their high school, and that's the same concept. And we just find that, I mean, most of the time kids don't take showers 
in the school. You're right. Um, and no one no. will because it's an open concept, right? Like, I don't know who yeah. back in the, the old country of the United States thing. decided we could all go shower together, but that's an, an antiquated model that needed to change. And uh, so, I mean, I think we need to, you know, as we as we move forward, we need to look at redesigning a number of these design flaws and making them more up to date. So I know that at one point I want to reach to the middle school guys. We, talk, we talked about maybe even high school um, feet counts. Is it being able to see how many feet are in the stalls? Is that do we strike a balance on that, or is that still necessary? Or I think we one talk had been I heard them talk about having video cameras in the open area so that we if some if more than one person would enter a bathroom we would have that document that would be the violation of our bathroom policies. Yeah. Yep. That's something that uh Three Rivers has added. So they've added vape sensors to every stall and then also off of the corridors, um, new cameras. They already have cameras in all the corridors, but new cameras that look at the entryways to see how many kids. So when they go find some new graffiti, they know exactly who to bust. Mm -hmm. Or when the vape sensor goes off yeah. and look and go, ah. But yeah, we'll we'll fix the doors, both the gap and the durability, the safety comfort that you discussed. Yeah, and I and I like the cameras in those open spaces. I mean, I think yeah. what we just we need to be more proactive about protection and safety. Unfortunately, we just live in a different world. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So whatever money we need to spend, um, should say that in front of the architect. <laughs> 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 So I mean we are we're showing the kind of lower cost option with the with the toilet partition front, but we can go to a framed wall. Um, it takes a little more space because we take something that's an inch and suddenly it's four inches. Um, it is a little more costly for the hardware and the doors, but that is an option to go just with a normal solid wood door. Well, they need to be hygienic, right? And I recognize the wear and tear. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of things to balance, and so we do. We want to find. We want to find the right material. Um, but for, from at least from this one board member, protection and safety is first, and then everything else comes second. So there is a balance, and I'm sure we can figure out what works best for us. Yes. Uh, we'll meet with them. Look at materials. Mm -hmm. okay. CMGC, right? CMGC. So uh, if there's no more questions on the layouts of floor plans, I can kind of jump into the next steps. Yep. All right. um, what we like to recommend for these projects, and I know the district is familiar with these on all of the seismic retrofits that we've done, it is the construction manager general contractor approach. What that is is an alternate procurement method to getting construction done by a contractor. With that, you do have to go through a series of steps um, for the Oregon Revised Statutes and the Oregon Administrative Rules. The first step in that is to provide a findings of fact document that says that this is still a competitive process. This contractor still goes out and gets three bids at the time before we get to construction. There's no favoritism. Because these are nuanced in their existing buildings, there's also a bit of expertise that we want from the contractors that are working in these existing spaces. We're gonna be affecting existing plumbing and existing mechanical and electrical um, and just building systems in general. <clears throat> so what the CMGC process does, it brings the contractor on during design. And now they're providing us cost estimates, constructability review, pulse on the submarket to know where our plumbers and the tile guys and our masons are at so that we can make decisions on what's the best design approach um, for the finishes or for the, the types of um, hardware that we choose for our doors. Do we do tile or do we do an FRP for our wet walls? Then with that, um, we reiterate the design. They're giving us an estimate along the way so that we're sitting within the district's set budget, the pot that you can't really add much more to. Um, then when it comes time to bid this out, they go and do that competitive process. They bid it out uh, to at least three sub trades. They'll also bid to self perform, which helps kind of in the overall pad of things to get a little bit more efficiency out of that. Then they give you a GMP guaranteed maximum price, and the district can review that. And um, within there, still have alternates or additions if we want to look at some other items just to see where they price out. 
accept that guaranteed maximum price, and then move into construction. And so through that process, typically with the CMGC, when they start out early in the design, you start with, here's the budget and here's my contingency. And along the way, what they're doing is saying, okay, I understand it further. My contingency is less. Okay, your budget to build this is here. And now we might have a little extra to take it a little bit further. So next steps on the board side will be presenting the findings of fact. So at the next board meeting, and we have all of these templates and documents that follow the Oregon administrative rules and device statutes so that you're on par with the law along the way. Uh, essentially, we present that to the board as the contracting authority. You contract the contractor, so to speak. Uh, once you've approved that, the next day we can post a request for proposals for local CMDCs. That would be your Adroit Construction, your SMB James, your Vitus, Outlier, all of the, the large general contractors in the area. And then that's about a three, four week process. They get selected, they're on board, and they start their cost estimating services and their constructability review right away. And then we move into looking at, all right, what is our schedule over the summer? What are the best steps to get these restrooms done early um, and ready for the next school year? So that's kind of the CMGC in a nutshell. So at the next board meeting, that's the direction we would like to go. We're getting a findings of fact, get that approval and post a request for proposals for these contractors. Now we can go the traditional method, which is just design build, putting it right out on the market and getting bids that way and reviewing them from general contractors. But what we found is the CMGC allows us to make design decisions along the way so that we can stay within the budget. Instead of right before construction, we've got our bids. Now we got to go back to the design board on a few things to get it into the budget. So, any questions? No. Sounds okay. good. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. CMGC. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. Either February 28th or March 14th. Can you be ready by February 28th? Yeah. February 28th. Thank you. Great. Point putting it off. We're already buying three reserves. We already have maximum price. <laughs> I was making sure they weren't done. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you guys. All right. 5.0. You're up. All right. Well, this is fun. So uh, we were going to announce the new principal tonight for the very first time, but when we approached her and offered her the position she was pretty sure that she could not keep a secret and she had no poker face and she would not be able to keep it <laughs> 24 hours let alone eight days so ladies and gentlemen our new principal of grants past five for next year uh true fact i do not have a very good poker face so i told tim and trish I'm so like, hi. i can't i can't keep it a secret um, and too many people were walking by my office, giving me the eyeball, like, is it you? Is it you? And I wasn't making eye contact with them at all on that day. Um, I'm super excited. Uh, I've been here my entire educational career. I love Grants Pass High School. Um, taught many of your guys' kids. Um, I love our staff. I love our kids. And so I'm excited for the opportunity. And um, it's, it's going to be fun. So I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Thank you. Welcome. Thank We're very excited. All right. Um, classified Appreciation Week is coming up March 6th through 10th. Um, and we're going to have a uh, resolution here to honor our classified folks. We also have some cake that we're going to be delivering them that week. And we have some notes that they're going to sign, right? So we're excited. And we could not do this job without the awesome folks that serve their kids in so many different ways. So we appreciate them a great deal. You ready? Yep. One of the things you asked me to do uh, back in August was to start putting some policies up on the website in Spanish. We have, I think, seven or eight completed. There it is. There we go. So um, we're uh, getting those done as quickly as we can. We picked some that we thought were the most uh, important to get done right away. So 
It's going to take us a while to get them all up there, but we will eventually get those get that taken care of. Job security for somebody. <laughs> Does the state not publish their they do not policies in Spanish? No. The problem is is that depending on which Spanish speaking country you're from, there is nuance to the language. And since this is the law of the land in Grants Pass School District, it has to be accurate. So one of the things we put on there is a disclaimer up there that it's provided as public service, but that only the English versions are, yeah. Does it say that in Spanish? I hope it does. <laughs> does it, does it say that it's- yeah. If you translate the, if you can translate the whole website so that it would. Yeah. But that little paragraph should. It is. Okay. So a little clarification. Select so board policies are providing Spanish as public service, not legally binding. Should be in Spanish also. So I'm just not seeing it. If you if you chose if you choose the Spanish. There it is. There you go. Thank you. All right. A little bit. Clarification, Scott mentioned the state policies, but there are no state policies. Right. We we, we contract with OSBA Correct. to give us potential policies for adoption. Correct. Okay. So I misspoke, but I would think that OSBA, given the current climate, would be helpful in providing us and with we've Spanish templates. Found them to be less than helpful in this room. <laughs> We have contacted them on numerous occasions. I've actually called Jim Green and he told me he'd get back to me. I called him back and said, you didn't get back to me. He said he'd get back to me. So um, we did it ourselves. We did it ourselves. Yes. Um, can you go to the next one? Next one. And we put some resources for board members on the website just so that they have a place to go, board roles, board chairs. So helpful. It's about time. We didn't know what to do. There you go. Communication, board meetings, keeps scrolling down a little bit. There you go. Those so, are all links. So those are links, yeah. We so, really struggle with that collaborating part. <laughs> a few other things that I want to share with the board tonight real quick. Um, uh, you're gonna have a vote tonight on whether or not to extend an invitation to Newbridge School uh, to D7 for next year. Didn't know if you had any questions you wanted to ask before we got to that point. Okay. GP Flex moving across the street here on uh, Dean Street. Um, and we have been putting together an advertising campaign. And I say we and the Royal Sons, right? That's <laughs> not really me. Uh, um, Keith and Kristen have been starting that work. Um, so we're gonna be doing that pretty quickly. We've also started to send any parent who's asked for an inter-district transfer out of the district, they have to talk to Keith first. So. Yeah, if they want to go to, I don't know, what was the one from yesterday or two days ago? There was one going on to Baker Webb. And Baker Webb. And so, yeah, in order for me to sign that, they have to talk to Keith first. And Keith gets a chance to sell on GP Flex before they leave the district. So, a um, couple of legislative updates that I thought would be important for you to hear about. The big one would be Senate Bill 819, which is the partial day schedule for students on an IEP. That law is going to change all indications are before spring break and take effect over spring break, which basically says that if a parent wants a student who's on a partial day school student schedule, that if they want them to go to full day, we have to honor that regardless of the impact on the district in any way, shape, or form. Whether we have the staff to do that, whether we have the space, it will be irrelevant. Once the parent says they want a full day schedule, we have five days to accommodate that. We've asked for the law to at least be starting for next school year, and we were told emphatically, no, that it's going to start at spring break. So, How far along in that? Basically, it goes on the 20th. 
and every expectation is the gut. It will pass both chambers and the governor will sign it. We know so, how many students that could potentially be in our district? 35. We don't believe all 35 will ask for a full day schedule, but that's currently where we're at. Um, so one of the things we've talked about was there should be a funding mechanism for this. We talked at the legislative uh, night in Phoenix with Lily Morgan. Lily Morgan's already started that process and presented a bill to expand funding for students on IEPs. We currently have an 11% cap for the for every district in the state. We're trying to get that increased to 12% with additional funding, not just changing the funding formula, but <laughs> adding funding to it. Um, the D7 share of that would be about a million dollars. So Lily's already started that process and is working with Senator Kessler, who's leading the charge on all of this to get more funding for K-12, uh, special education K-12. Um, there's also some measures on minimum pay for employees that could see the light of day. The starting teacher salary would be a minimum of $60,000. Currently, a starting teacher in Grants Pass makes 48, 48. But we saw in Baker School District today that their starting teachers make 38. So that would be a 56% increase, pay increase for uh, first time teachers, first year teachers. Uh, also, changes to how classified staff are paid. That's on the docket as well. We think both of those are um, have a real shot of passing at the state level and being signed into law. Summer school funding does not look very helpful this year. They've given, so far the governor's budget has $20 million in summer school funding, which is only for K-5 literacy not for any enrichment and not for any credit recovery or retrieval at the high school level, um, no enrichment at the secondary level. Um, we're concerned about that and we're working on that. But we're really flying solo on that because COSA, who usually does this work with us, has decided that it's not an important enough battle for them to take on that overall getting the state school fund up where we need it is more important than the summer school aspect. And there's only so many, so many fights they can fight. And they're not going to take summer school. On. So I've been reaching out to Lily Morgan and see what we can do with that. We'll see what she can do. Um, operations managers, manager position. We did interviews, three of them today. We have one more tomorrow. We plan to make a decision here pretty quickly on that. And you should be receiving information from me by the end of the week on who would be selected. Um, let's see, after school supper program has started at Gladiola, correct? And has it been at any of the elementaries yet? Not yet. Okay. So it's one of the reasons we did the slow rollout is because we wanted to be done well. And the first week wasn't so great. And so, um, We've been working on getting that process up and better. So I think the most meals we served at any one time was five. It was our high watermark, which is not what we not what we're hearing the need is. And we're so we're doing this slow so we do it correctly, but we are feeding our kids and we'll be continuing to do that. Those are things going on and Lots of other things going on. Of course, we have negotiations with both unions happening, things like that. But those are highlights for tonight. Any questions? Thank you. Does yep. Lily have a bill to, to help fund the teacher salary? Uh, not yet. Okay. I will talk to her. But she was really <clears throat> quite impressed with you folks and really took to heart the message that you gave her and took that back to Salem. She was very appreciative. So, so I was going to make some comments about the Newbridge School. So I don't know if you 
do that after the motion. Uh, you just said I do it now. Go ahead. Board reports and special concerns now. So it's a perfect time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I um, did do a tour at Newbridge High School. And I'd have to say initially, I was a little concerned that it, um, Newbridge High School is outside the mission really of District 7 and it would, it's not part of your mission, you shouldn't really do it. But after going there and uh, talking with the staff and principal, Principal at, Regal from Newbridge. At the uh, Newbridge. The students there, um, I think it was told 45% or so of them are Josephine Jackson County kids, um, the remainder are from elsewhere, and that those students um, oftentimes tend to stay in our community after their time there. Also, the students that are there are students that have um, a lot of the ACEs that uh, the Project Youth Plus groups deal with. So it started to feel more like they were kids here in District 7 that we should also be serving. Um, it also looked like there was significant opportunity for District 7 to actually help with the education of the students there at the high school. And some of that can't happen immediately, but in future years and future versions of GW Flex, um, there will be opportunities for some of those students to participate in some of the educational opportunities we have here in District 7. So I guess by the end of the time, um, I decided it was our mission and uh, just wanted to say I was going to support um, us supporting Newbridge High School here in District 7. So, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other board reports or special concerns? All right, moving on to action items. 7.1, second and final reading of updated policies and ARs. Want to take them individually? Just one. Individually or all together? Oh, there is. Well, we'll take I'll all together. I agree. <laughs> take them one at a time, please. <laughs> this is Member Nelson. I uh, motion we accept 7.1.1 personal communication. Member Aguilera, second. Okay, having a second, is there any discussion? Okay, Member Nelson? Yes. Member Aguilera? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. Member Wilkins? Yes. Okay, 7.2, approved Newbridge School, or invite Newbridge is, School. Right, it is an invitation. Still some paperwork to get done before it would actually happen. Uh, this is Member Nelson. I wholeheartedly make a motion to extend an invitation to Newbridge School to join Grants Pass District 7. Member Aguilera, second. Having a second, is there any discussion? Hearing none. Member Nelson? Yes. Member Aguilera? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. All right, 7.4, approve moving GP Flex to Dean. People not 7.3. No, 7.3. Someone already needs to be a local service plan. Oh, we passed it on time. 7.3, <laughs> SO, ESD local service plan. There's no changes to it. It's the same one you've seen many years around. Uh, Member Nelson, motion to approve 7.3. Member Aguilera, second. <laughs> Washman's reading. 
Member Nelson? Yes. Member Aguilera? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. Member Wilkins? Yes. All right. We're really excited about 7.4. Approve moving GP Flex to Dean Street. Member Nelson moves to approve 7.4. I'll bet Member Aguilera is yeah. <laughs> Having a second, is there any discussion? Member Nelson? Yes. Member Aguilera? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. Uh, 7.5 approval of resolution um, for employee classified appreciation week. Uh, Member Nelson, so moved to approve 7.5. Member Aguilera, second. <laughs> Having a second, is there any discussion? Yeah. Well, I think it's a very good idea. Excellent. Thank you for mixing it up. Tanya? Member Nelson? Yes. Member Aguilera? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. Member Walton? Yes. 7.6 approval of advanced medical skills. Member Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Member Aguilera, second. Uh, any discussion? Anya? I'm excited for this. <laughs> Member Nelson? Yes. Member Aguilera? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Yes. Coleman? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. Excellent. 8.0 future meeting dates, uh, board workshop February 28th at 5, board meeting March 14th at 5. And policy advisory committee March 21st at 5 p.m. And I'm going to call a recess. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, gives me that. Or that. <laughs> All right. Uh, reconvene general session. And um, we are looking to vote on 10.3.1. Anybody the motion machine down? Oh no, I'm going to pass the baton with the rose over to Please, Gary. Gary, anybody go ahead and make the motion. Somebody. All at once. All at once. I move that we approve uh, ten point one. Ten point three. Ten point three point one and ten point three point two. I move that. Let me restate. I move that we approve ten point three negotiations for. MOA GPA EA draft retire rehire and MOA G pass draft retire rehire. Member Nelson second. Any discussion? Tanya? Member Nelson? Yes. Aguilera? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. Member Wilkins? Yes. Okay. Adjourn. General session. That was not recommended. All right. Bye, ladies. <laughs>